Well, good evening, friends. Father Frank Pavone here, National Director of Priests for Life. It's uh, so good to be with you, and uh, we really have uh, the joy of welcoming you in the name of Alveda King. I know many of you are watching on her stations. We have uh, on her platforms, rather. She works with our ministry um, on a full-time basis and has done so uh, since uh about 2005, we met back in 1999. So she sends her greetings tonight, as does uh, our executive director, Janet Morana, and uh, our whole team, as a matter of fact. And, and in the name of our whole team, I want, to know, I want you to know that we pray for you, and uh, we want to pray for you right now, lift up all your intentions, and then I want to talk to you about the elections, just a few observations. But let's turn to the Lord in the prayer that he gave us and uh, unite all our intentions as we all pray for one another, for our families, for our needs, and for the work that we do for his kingdom. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, now and forever. Amen. You can win this election. You watching now, just you, can win this whole election. We know how close many races are. And it is not just a matter of, it isn't a matter, in fact, of getting tens of millions of people or even millions. It may be just a matter of thousands here or there or even hundreds. You remember the election of the year 2000. 537 votes just here in the state of Florida to determine the outcome of the presidential race. It depends on you, all of you listening right now, using every day to reach more and more voters. That's what we empower you to do. That's what we encourage you to do. It's a matter of winning back the House, getting the House of Representatives out of the hands of people who don't know how to govern. All they know how to do is obstruct. All they know how to do is conduct sham investigations. All they know how to do is pour money into the killing of babies by abortion. All they know how to do is to defame the character of the best president of the United States that we've had. All they know how to do is to try to distract his staff from getting the work done that he's doing for the American people and instead pull together all kinds of needless documents for needless investigations that go nowhere. And they know that they're going nowhere because they know they're making it up. They've been making it up throughout this entire Congress. They know from the beginning that it's going to go nowhere. They know from the beginning that they're going to be debunked, but they don't care. Because the purpose is twofold, remember, of all these phony investigations and nonsensical, in fact, un-American, America-hating, we should say, actions against the presidential administration trying to undo the results of the 2016 elections which makes it such a, a laughing stock uh, what Kamala Harris was saying last night about uh, you know uh, President Trump uh, uh, oh well you know we don't know if he's going to accept the peaceful transition of power uh, what a ridiculous accusation in the first place but 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 you know, <laughs> Call about, talk about the pot calling the kettle black. These Democrats haven't accepted the, the outcome of the 2016 elections, and they've been trying to undermine it ever since. So these people have, they know that these, these they knew already these, these, these investigations would go nowhere. They do it for two purposes. Number one, to take away the energy, divert the energy and time and attention of the people working in the administration from instead of doing carrying out the agenda that the administration sets on this uh, 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 instead uh, they have to gather documents and they have to prepare testimony and they have to spend time with these committees and so forth and the second is to try to steal the headlines 
They would rather have the headlines, and they have a very cooperative left-wing fake news media. Uh, they would rather have the headlines say, you know, President Trump under investigation for Russia collusion hoax, uh, for Russia, Russia collusion, or uh, impeachment, 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 um, rather than 17-year record of, of reduction in poverty in our country, higher r rise in the median, uh, income, household income of Americans more than under George W. Bush, more than under Barack Obama. They don't want that to be the headline. Peace accord in the Middle East with Israel. Any number of accomplishments. 20,000 gang, vicious gang members were cleared out of our American communities by the Trump administration so far. New effort to protect our children in school from uh, sexual assault. Uh, a plan to eradicate HIV AIDS within a decade. They don't want these to be the headlines. These are the truth. These are some of the accomplishments. The VA, VA choice, VA accountability, 9,000 people fired from the Veterans Administration who weren't doing their job for the vets, but under Obama, oh, they couldn't be fired. But no, President Trump got them out of there. They don't want that being the headline, these Democrats. That would look, make, look, make the Republicans look too good. That would make President Trump look too good. That might make him look like a leader. That might make him look like a president. No, 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 they can't take that. They want the headlines to be about whatever stupid investigation they're undertaking that they know already is going to go nowhere. Doesn't matter to them that they're lying. Adam Schiff getting up there and just lying. <laughs> These people don't care. We've got to get the House of Representatives out of the hands of these corrupt, lying, anti-American, baby-killing, God-hating Democrats. Got to get them out of power. This election is in your hands. Doesn't matter what the political pundits are saying, doesn't matter what the polls say. People will say, oh, well, you know, we don't expect the House of Representatives to change hands from the uh, Democrats to the Republicans. Well, I got news for you. We've got to make it happen. We need you to make it happen. We need you starting today and sparing no effort between now and November the 3rd to open your mouths, to open your emails, to shout from the rooftops, to reach every single voter you can, to create a peaceful revolution in this country that will get these God-hating, baby-killing, lying Democrats out of power. Every last single one of them out of power. Ask them if they're willing to protect babies. These people are, are, are funding and promoting and hailing and praising, defending and promoting the dismemberment and decapitation of babies. They have absolutely no right to get on any kind of moral high horse to anyone about anything. They have no right to get on their ridiculous soapbox to talk about failure of the president with the coronavirus. He did not fail. He is not failing to address this thing. He did a better job than any one of them or all of them put together could ever do if they were in the position that he has been in over this last year. Brothers and sisters, the fact of the matter is that they are engaged in a massive effort of self-justification because their conscience is seared. They know they have innocent blood on their hands because they're overseeing, paying for, defending and promoting a holocaust. Let me say that again. The Democrats in the House of Representatives, they are overseeing and cheerleading, promoting and funding a holocaust. So obviously their consciences are, 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 are seared, they have blood on their hands. And one of the ways that the human psyche deals with that, unable to admit the evil that is within their own hearts and therefore to feel terrible about themselves, it's much easier to say we should feel terrible about someone else than to admit how terrible we should feel about ourselves. It's much easier to blame someone else for complicity in taking lives than to admit that we're complicit in taking lives. This is the psychological reverse mechanism, the denial and the projection 
that's taking par place in the Democrat Party. Now, those of you who know some psychology will be able to appreciate what I'm saying, especially if you study the psychological research connected with the damage that abortion does to the human psyche. You've got an entire party here that has embraced abortion. They're deep in denial about it. They cannot describe what the procedure is. They'll get up and give talks about freedom of choice and constitutional rights and women's health, but they won't talk about dismemberment and decapitation, the words that are used, by the way, in the medical textbooks that that describe how, what, how abortions are done, but they won't use those words. Because again, admit what abortion is, and you're going to feel pretty darn bad about yourself, and about your party, and about your friends, and about your legislative agenda, and about your spending bills that pump more money into the baby killing industry, which Kamala Harris loves. He loves Planned Parenthood. Just look at her record. Oh no. They're not going to admit how bad abortion is, and they're certainly not going to tell you. And they won't answer a single question from a single voter about what it is or how bad it is. They won't even describe it. They'll defend it, but they won't describe it. That's how you know someone's on the wrong track. They won't describe what they defend. <laughs> That's pretty bad. You can't govern a nation like that. They've got to be out of power, brothers and sisters. Out of power. Because they're baby killers. No, oh, no, 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 no. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Oh, no, no, that's not us. Oh, yes, it is. What do you think abortion is? We ask these people, do you want abortion to be legal or not? Just ask them. You all have a, a, somebody running for the House of Representatives, don't you? United States House of Representatives, somewhere in your life, there's a candidate asking for your vote. It's two candidates, maybe more, in your district. But in most places, you're two candidates. They're asking for your vote to represent you. They work for you, not the other way around. They want to represent you in the United States House of Representatives. They want the title of congressman. Oh, that sounds nice. You know what, you know what title goes in front of somebody's name when they're elected to Congress? You know this, right? The Honorable. Fill in the blank. First name, last name. They're asking for your vote. U.S. House of Representatives. Let's talk about the House. They're asking for your vote. Jane Smith, John Jones, whoever it is. They might already be in Congress and they're asking for another term. Two-year terms they serve. Or maybe they've never been in Congress. They want to get in, they're knocking at the door. They're coming to you. Because you're the only, only one who can put them in there. By your vote. And if you elect them, if you put them in there, they're going to be able to write your laws. They're going to be able to write the laws that your children, grandchildren live under. You're going to be able to write our laws. Of course, the president has to sign those laws, and also the senators have to agree with those laws, but they have a big role. And when you, and if you vote, if enough of you vote for them to put them into that seat representing your district where you live, where your family lives, well then, they get the title, the Honorable. Now, they have that title. Let me ask you a question. Should I protect a baby? I don't know how many ways there are to answer that question, but I think most of us would agree that the answers are either yes or no or I don't know, right? I mean, is there a fourth alternative? Yes, I should protect the baby. No, I don't have to. 
I don't know. Can you tell me which of these three answers is honorable? Let's start with this one. If I don't know, oh, I don't know if, if this is really a baby. I don't know when human life begins. I don't know if a pregnant woman is carrying a human being. I don't know if that's a person. I don't know if they have human rights. I don't know if they should have constitutional rights. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Well, maybe before you, you ask me to put you in a position where you can govern this country and help to write its laws, before you have a vote, which could be in any case the deciding vote, on a particular piece of legislation that is going to incorporate our mores as a society that is, going to, that is supposed to protect our rights and guide our way of life and promote our security and, and laws that my family have to obey and my children. And maybe before I give you that kind of awesome privilege and power, maybe, uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe, you, maybe you need to figure out a basic question. Are you supposed to protect the baby? Of course, if they say no, they'll try to say no by denying that it's a baby. Well, that disqualifies you too. Go back to grade school biology if you want to know that it's a baby. But don't, don't, invoke, don't invoke your religion, Pelosi, oh, I'm a faithful and practicing Catholic. Would you give me a break? You are no such thing. Oh, my faith, I take my faith seriously. You know what? Go take your faith seriously. But get yourself out of our lawmaking body. If you can't understand the basic fact that a pregnant woman is carrying a baby, you have no business being in the lawmaking body of the United States, much less third in line for the presidency. Go back home. Practice your faith. Pray to God in private, and maybe, just maybe, he'll give you enough common sense to know that a pregnant woman is carrying a baby. So if they say no, they'll try to wiggle out of it, but you know what? These, these Democrats, they're deluded, brothers and sisters, they're liars. These Democrats, you know what they'll say? You heard this on display last night. I'm going to talk a little bit more about last night. I'm sure you're all interested in some commentary about that. But you know what these Democrats will say now? They got on this high horse when they talk about COVID-19. They get on this high horse when they start talking about um, uh, yeah, climate change. You know what their, 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 one of their favorite slogans is now? Well, we follow... What is it now? Tell me. We follow... The science. What a laughing stock this group of people have become. A laughing stock to the world. A laughing stock to the scientific community. A laughing stock to America. A laughing stock to a grade school biology student. When they don't know enough science to realize that a pregnant woman is, is carrying a baby inside of her. They actually do know, but they don't know how to get out of this uncomfortable question, should I protect a baby? Because they can't bring themselves to protect the baby, well, then it's a simple psychological mechanism to deny that it's a baby. If you want to justify your wrongdoing against another person, just deny that they're a person. And hey, that's a, that's a get free, get out of jail card. Very simple. And this is why it really, it's really disgusting. It makes me laugh how people, they, they, they pretend to resolve the abortion debate simply by you know, just jumping over any of the reasons or the arguments and just jumping to the conclusion that they want to come to to justify their behavior. Oh, they're not people! Oh, that's not a baby! It 
Isn't that an easy excuse? Why doesn't a perpetrator of a crime say that about any victim? Somebody that wants to go out and cause a riot or shoot people in the streets, stab people, or maybe blow up buildings, or fly airplanes into buildings? They're not people. Or have other kinds of holocausts? Genocide? Gas chambers? Oh, they're not people. And this mistake and this lie has been told throughout the annals of human history. Some of the darkest chapters of human history. Some of the biggest bloodsheds of human history. Justified in their own head by simply erasing the people. Erase the victims and then you're not guilty of a crime anymore, are you? You're not guilty of a, of a moral wrongdoing. You're not guilty of a sin. Oh, how easy it is. Just say, they're not people. Wow, congratulations. You got a magic wand there. Justify any kind of wrongdoing. So either the honorable representative that represents you or wants to get that title, and only you can give it to them, is going to say, I don't know, in which case they shouldn't be making any decisions about laws if they don't know the answer to this. Or they're going to say no, in which case they shouldn't be making any decisions about laws. The only honorable answer to this question is yes. And the only honorable stance is, it's not up to me to decide whether that's a baby or not, any more than it's up to me to decide whether you are a human being or not. I don't get to decide that. It doesn't matter what I think about you. Or what harm I may want to do to you, does the amount of harm I may want to do to you for whatever misguided reason allow me to just pretend you're not a person? No, 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 friends, look. We've got, a, we've got an election here for House of Representatives. Now, you have got to look into who your candidates are. Now, if they're Democrat. You can count on about half of one hand how many of them are going to be saying explicitly yes to this question. Unfortunately, that's just the way it is. I'm telling you the way it is. Check it out for yourselves. If they're Democrat, they're going to be pro-abortion. If they're Republican, they're going to be pro-life. This, the, this is the political reality of our time. And to say that isn't even a political statement. It's just a, 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 a measurement of the reality of, 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 of how it is in our nation at this point in time. So that's an easy way to be able to tell. But ask them for yourself. Let them speak for themselves. But if you don't ask them this question before you vote for them, you're missing a key responsibility of your, uh, of your, of your vote, a key responsibility of your civic life. You've got to ask them this question. And many of them, hey, listen, they've already voted. If they're already in Congress, they have a voting record. You could find out what it is. You can find out the information about the candidates. You can find out the, the um, voting records of the candidates. Take a few minutes and carefully read this web page, Voting Info. VotingInfo.org. Positions of the candidates. You'll see the voting records of those who are in Congress. You'll have links to a voter guide that gives you all kinds of information about them, not only their positions on the issues, but whom they endorsed, who endorsed them. Did Planned Parenthood endorse them? Did Planned Parenthood give them money? Did they give money to Planned Parenthood? One of the reasons that that's a gauge of this is that Planned Parenthood is the biggest child-killing industry in the nation, and so on and so forth. Okay, so we've got to win back the House of Representatives and put it into the hands of people who are honorable enough to realize that they have a responsibility to protect little babies. Now, the U.S. Senate, not every senator is up for re-election. Some are retiring, some are asking for re-election, others are, you know, knocking on the door. As I say, they haven't been in the Senate yet, they want to get in, only you can let them in. Pay attention if your state has a race for United States Senate. Brothers and sisters, we've got to keep the Senate. The Senate right now is in Republican hands. We've got to keep it that way. Why is that so important? Well, again, the Senate Democrats, you know, they've got a lot of bad positions. But they are supporting a holocaust. 
You know, we've gotten so used to this. We think that abortion is just, it's just a matter of disagreement between people. <laughs> they're supporting a Holocaust. We can't let them stay in office if they're going to continue to do that. We can't. Got to get them out. Because the Senate Democrats, watch how they behave next week when, they, when the hearings begin for Judge Amy Coney Barrett to get onto the Supreme Court. The hearings will be next week, starting Monday. Watch the Senate Democrats. Watch them put on another circus. And it's all about abortion. Because they know that the kind of judges President Trump is nominating for the courts, most of whom, you know, the Democrats will vote against most of them, most of the Democrats will vote against most of the judges because they know these are pro-life people. They're not going to find a right to abortion in the Constitution. Of course, they judge that way not because it's their personal view, but because it's not in the Constitution. And they dread the day when this so-called right to abortion will be struck down by the courts but they shouldn't be surprised that it would be struck down by the courts. And it's not primarily because of President Trump. It's because of the Founding Fathers. The Constitution does not say you have a right to kill a baby. And you just need to just say that. The Constitution does not say that you have a right to kill a baby. It's nowhere there. It's not there. It never has been. And so to say that abortion is some kind of constitutional right, you are making things up. Do you want somebody that writes your laws for you and your family making things up? Making up right? If they can say there's a constitutional right to an abortion when it is nowhere in the Constitution, then you have to ask the question, what else are they going to create? Now it's up to whom? Up to them? What else are they going to create? Once you open that door, there's no, there's, no, there's no boundary. See, the kind of judges President Trump appoints and that the Republican senators vote for, the kind of judge that Amy, Amy Coney Barrett is, these are people who say, listen, I don't, it doesn't matter what rights I believe exist or don't believe exist. I'm going to look at the Constitution. And if they're not there, I'm not going to put them there. That is honorable. In other words, they're saying, it's not up to me. Isn't it refreshing to have people in these positions of power and authority who recognize how limited their power and authority are? Isn't that refreshing? Isn't that freeing? This is what President Trump means by, one of the many things he means by, we're going to give power back to the American people. Have you heard him say that? Do you know why the crowds at his rallies chant, I love you, I love you, we love you? Because he gives power back to the American people. He realizes that we don't need, you know, senators in the Senate or judges on the courts or senators who are going to put judges on the courts or presidents who are going to nominate judges on the courts who think that it's up to them to decide what rights are in the Constitution or not. No, 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 no. This is up to you. If you want a public policy changed, rather on abortion or anything else, where do you go? I'm talking now to Americans because I presume if you're an American, okay, that you know and love the Constitution, I presume that you understand that when you vote for someone for the House of Representatives, when you vote for someone to be a United States Senator, when a Senator confirms someone to be on the court, do you realize that you're putting that person in a position where they have to swear a public oath to uphold the Constitution? So here's the thing we have to be concerned about, that the people who are putting them in this position 
actually believe in the Constitution. Love the Constitution. If we don't love the Constitution, why would we be voting for people to swear an oath to the Constitution? And why would we vote for people who don't believe in the Constitution, who believe that the Constitution is nothing other than a label to be put on what their own beliefs are? You following me? Either the Constitution has a meaning, and that's why they can swear an oath to it, or it means nothing other than what they want it to mean, which means they're just swearing an oath to themselves. Are those the kind of people you want writing laws for your children and grandchildren? Oh, I swear an oath to uphold faithfully my own ideas. So help me God. They might as well not say, so help me God. They might as well say, so help me myself. That's what these Democrats believe. They honestly believe that. That it's all up to them. They actually believe that. They write the Constitution. They decide what human rights are. They decide the meaning of the universe. They decide what's right and wrong. You don't want to give that kind of power to these people. You, 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 you don't want to... Because then you're taking power away from yourself. When the president says, I want to restore power to the American people, he's saying, look, the Constitution has a meaning. The Constitution protects us from the rule of men. I put men in quotations because we're talking about human beings, men and women. But the point is that the Constitution and the laws that have been passed by our lawmaking bodies, our representatives, they work for us, we don't work for them, says that we are a nation of laws not of men. What that means is that the governing authority that we all follow as a society doesn't depend on what somebody in power wants it to mean, but rather on what the Constitution already says and what the people decide. And we decide our laws through our elected lawmakers whom we choose because we agree with what they're saying, their approach, and their policies are going to be. Okay. We've got to win back the House, put it in pro-life Republican hands. We've got to win a more strong majority in the U.S. Senate. And we've got to win back, once again, for a second term, the White House and President Trump. Now, let me um, give you a few commentaries about, about uh, three things. I want to talk about the, uh, the presidential debate, the vice presidential debate, and then one of the topics that came up in the vice presidential debate, court packing. Let's start with the presidential debate. According to the schedule set by the uh, uh, Commission on Presidential Debates and agreed upon by the Trump campaign and the Biden campaign, the next uh, presidential debate was supposed to be a week from tonight, October 15th, Thursday. It was supposed to be a week from tonight. Now, last night, there was a great debate between the vice presidential candidates, usually vice presidential debates don't get as much attention or carry as much weight as this one did, but this election year is, you know, off the charts. Everything is unusual. Lots of things are unprecedented. And, you know, frankly, given the age of the two presidential candidates, uh, the, the, you know, people are thinking more about, well, who's, who's second in, in, in charge? Who's, who, who takes over if there's a, a, a problem? And so the vice presidential debate last night got a lot of attention. Um, and interestingly, and, and there's no question that, that Pence 
was dominant in that debate. He was victorious in that debate in the sense of making the most sense, making the most points, uh, uncovering the, the uh, inaccuracies and lies that uh, Kamala Harris and the Democrats uh, tell and Biden. And you know, Democrats got up this morning and they weren't feeling that great about that debate. So they started playing games. Let's change the topic quick when it comes to debates. Let's change the topic and quick. 7.30 this morning. Not at a normal time, you know, offices open up and people get to work and, and you know, uh, they do business and uh, they make announcements, they make decisions. Seven thirty in the morning, the decision is made, is announced by the Commission on Presidential Debates that the format of the October 15th debate is going to be changed. Now, why 7.30 this morning? Literally hours after a very strong, very good, very helpful to the Trump-Pence ticket performance in the debate by Vice President Mike Pence. Why? Why, oh why? At 7.30 this morning. And what did they say? It's going to be virtual. Now, obviously, we're living in a virtual world now. I, myself, instead of traveling around, we got, you know, we're right here in the studio uh, every day doing, they gave a talk today to the Ave Maria School of Law and did it vir virtually. Normally, I would have gone over there in person. So we know that we're living in a virtual world, a world of Zoom and other technologies. But wait a minute, they had already agreed to have an in-person debate. Vice President and Senator Harris had an in-person debate yesterday. They were separated. They had that plexiglass in the middle. I don't know what kind of, I mean, they believe in science. I, I, I've yet to hear the science of what that plexiglass was all about. What did that, what did that accomplish? Um, but now they want it to be a virtual debate. And this was unilateral from the, uh, from the commission. And Biden said, oh, yeah, oh, sure, that'll be great. I'll stay in my basement and I'll <laughs> turn on my camera and do the debate. And President Trump said, no, we agreed on an in-person debate. And the American people deserve that. Let's stick to the plan. And, you know, if you're concerned about uh, me uh, uh, passing along uh, the virus, well, let's, uh, I don't know, let's follow the science. Why don't we? And instead of following your imagination or your paranoia or your fears or your lies or your despicable attitude towards the President of the United States, why don't we just let the medical people tell us all if I am free of the virus? Now, the doctors of the President already said there is no evidence of the live virus in him, and this was already several days ago. So we're going to follow the science or not. Let the President have multiple tests, and he would. He wouldn't go be going into that debate without testing negative. Well, you think he's an animal? Some people do. That's because that's the, the identity they want to take on. What do they think, he's heartless? That's only because they are. Well, they think he's a liar? That's only because they are. What, what do they think, he doesn't care? That's simply because they don't. The president's going to go into an in-person debate. Of course he's going to be tested. You know what? He's tested everything he goes into, every place he goes. So do you Democrats believe in the science or not? You mean to tell me that we haven't been able to develop adequate testing regarding this virus? You see, they can't have it both ways. But they try to have it both ways and contort themselves into a bundle of lies, arrogance, deception. They're unworthy to govern. They can't govern. Biden can't govern. Harris can't govern. They, they don't belong in public office. They don't deserve our trust. They don't even make sense. Let me read a statement from the campaign manager for the Trump campaign, Bill Stepien. 
The American people should not be deprived of the chance to see the two candidates for president debate face to face two more times just because the Commission on Presidential Debates wants to protect Joe Biden. It remains extremely suspect that the Commission announced the brand new virtual format at 7.30 a.m. Eastern Time today, immediately after Vice President Mike Pence had just wiped the floor with Senator Kamala Harris. Clearly, the Commission wanted to shift attention away from Pence's complete victory. As President Trump said, a virtual debate is a non-starter and would clearly be a gift to Biden because he would be relying on his teleprompter from his basement bunker. Voters should have the opportunity to directly question Biden's 47-year failed record of leadership. We agree that this should happen on October 22nd. And accordingly, the third debate should then be shifted back one week to October 29th. You notice what, let me just interrupt here. You notice what the campaign is doing? They're saying, okay, you're concerned that the president is not adequately over the virus. Of course, we're not going to rely on your imagination or your paranoia. We're going to rely on the science, like you always say. We we happen to believe on the Trump Republican side, we happen to believe more in science than you do, you uh, deluded Democrats. But they're saying, okay, we can, we'll push it back uh, yet another week. And that's, that's a big thing to agree on for a reason I'll go into in just a moment. But we can agree that this will happen on October 22nd, a week later than it would have. But in order not to deprive the American people of the opportunity to see these men exchange their ideas and their vision for America and defend their policies, they're saying, let's have the third debate Then a week after that, see, October 22nd was supposed to be the third and final presidential debate, but the Trump campaign is saying, okay, you're afraid of this, uh, the president infecting you. Um, We won't have it on the 15th. We'll do the two debates on the 22nd and the 29th. And then the statement concludes by saying the commission and presidential candidate, uh, the commission and the media cannot hide Joe Biden forever. Americans deserve to hear directly from both presidential candidates on these dates, October 22nd and 29th. I want to ask you something. If Biden were elected, which he isn't going to be, but if Biden were elected, what is he, what is he planning to do? Govern the country from a teleprompter? Now, th- 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 think about it for a minute. Do you expect a president to be able to get in front of the American people and answer their questions and talk to them straight and clear without note cards, without a teleprompter, without a, 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 an earpiece, without somebody going like this and you know telling them what to say, pre-planned, pre-structured, everything. going to go meet with foreign leaders, going to go meet with the president of China or Russia or any of these other countries. We can go over there with a, with a portable teleprompter so you know what to say. We've got to have evidence, first of all, of the stamina of a man or a woman to be president of this country. And then we have to have evidence of the fact that they can deal with the issues without training wheels. So if you can't debate someone face-to-face without even the possibility, even the possibility of a help from a computer screen or a teleprompter, well, you certainly don't belong in the most powerful position in the United States or in the world. You don't belong there. Okay. The reason this is also important is, do you know that the uh, Trump campaign asked over the summer for the debates, the dates of the debates to be moved up. Did you know that? Over the summer, the Trump campaign pointed out that the dates are on an archaic schedule because the first presidential debate didn't take place until September 29th. Do you know when early voting started? September 4th. By the time September 29th rolled around, millions of people had already voted. And we knew that that was going to be the case because of the schedule of early voting, which was not the case back in the 1980s 
when like 5% of the voters voted before election day. Now more like half of them do. So 10 times more voters vote early now than did back in the 80s. And back then, where only 5% uh, of them were voting before Election Day, the first presidential debate was held even earlier than September 29th. So why start so late? The, the, the Trump campaign said, listen, I'm going to have three debates, but why don't we start the first one at the beginning of September? Give the voters, in other words, the biggest amount of information possible to make their decision. Well, unless you're afraid of what your candidate is going to say. And see, that's the case of what's really going on here. That's why they don't want... See, see Biden is, Biden's playing this trick together with the uh, presidential uh, uh, commission here on uh, debates. He doesn't want to debate uh, President Trump. And he, and he doesn't want to talk to the American people. Where was he all summer? Where, what is this business of putting the lid on at the beginning of the day? He tells the press, oh, it's full lid, closed for the day. That means there's going to be no more commentary that day. Nothing more that the press has to hear about coming from his office, press releases or press conferences. or whatever. Where, where is he? Compare the number of press conferences Biden has done with the number that Trump has done. Go ahead, just look it up. Compare it. If you can't talk to the people, how can you lead the people? If you can't take questions from the people, how can you be accountable to the people? President Trump is talking to the press all the time. Look at all of those daily press briefings during the height of the, of the coronavirus. He's not afraid to talk to the press. He's not afraid to do like he did recently, an open town hall to an unfriendly audience. He's not afraid at all. He calls them fake news, but he's not, he's not afraid to engage them. Biden doesn't even call them fake news, and he's afraid to engage them. He knows they're on his side, and he's afraid to engage them. Why? So they said, let's, let's move it up, or we can add an additional debate earlier in September. Biden campaign did not agree. Didn't want it. Why not? Give the voters maximum amount of information. Okay, last night was a great night for Vice President Pence really making the case to the American people and we're going to look in the coming days a little bit more in detail at some of the things that were said in that debate. We re-aired it today on these channels where you're watching now. Um, but I just want to point out uh, Kamala Harris, she um, said quite a few lies. In fact, I have a list here of some 24 false or misleading statements that Senator Harris made last night. These have got to be brought to your attention and the attention of the American public. I'm not going to go through all of them now, but let me just give you a couple of highlights. Harris said, the president said coronavirus was a hoax. Hmm. Why shut down the economy then? Why call in private companies and have them start changing their manufacturing from uh, alcohol to uh, hand sanitizer? Why shut down travel from China? Why uh, shut down travel from Europe, from Great Britain? Why mobilize the entire government and invoke the D Defense Production Act and, and, and convene a task force and, and spend every waking hour fighting a virus that doesn't exist? These critics of the president, they're sick. They're literally sick because they absolutely have, absolutely, they have no shame. The way they lie, the way they distort the record, the way they deceive and want to deceive you and me. President Trump said it was a hoax. He never said any such thing and he certainly didn't act like it either. Why would she say such a thing? They don't have a plan. They still don't have a plan. Oh, my goodness. You didn't see the, 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 the whole litany of plans? Not only is there a plan, and has there been a plan, a plan that's been carried out to deal with the coronavirus, there are multiple plans. There's a whole national plan for each different segment of dealing with the virus, for the economy 
for the testing, for the distribution of medical equipment, for the reopening of schools, and on and on. For all the different dimensions of the coronavirus, what do you think? The president is just getting up one day and, and just, you know, based on a dream he had or a whim that he has, telling people what to do about this? He's got entire teams of experts from all different walks of life. There's multiple plans, and they are out there for everybody to see. To come up onto a national stage like this and to say, in the light of the fact that there are multiple, which they're not secret, they're public. In fact, the United States Congress just did a review of the administration's response to the coronavirus and published it. It's available on, on just Google it. Congressional Task Force uh, Coronavirus uh, Report came out on October 2nd, came out just less than a week ago. And it's like, she gets up and says there's no plan. Is she absolutely, either she's absolutely ignorant of the multiple plans, the multiple plans that have been in effect for months and that are public information. My goodness, a fifth grader can find out that there's a plan and has been a plan for the coronavirus uh, 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 pandemic. A fifth grader can find out, and Kamala Harris can't. Either she is ignorant to the point that she doesn't deserve to, to, to run for city council, much, much less vice president, or she is dishonest to the point that she should not run for city council, much less vice president. It's one or the other, or or both, but certainly nothing honorable here, nothing worthy of the high office to which she, she aspires. And she and her party have the gall to call the president a liar? When she actually sits up there on a national stage and says the words, go back and look at the, the, the debate, I have the words right here, they still don't have a plan. There's no words for this. And people are actually going to vote for these people to take the reins of the most powerful country in the world and to, and to have authority in our lives. They don't have a plan. What can possibly justify saying these words? Oh, and then she goes on to talk about Charlottesville again. Again! Back early in President Trump's uh, term, uh, the Charlottesville riots broke out over a disagreement about the removal of the statue of Robert E. Lee. Okay, so you know, can understand people are going to have different opinions about that. And so there were peaceful protests. People were divided in, 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 in the merits of, of taking down that statue, and people made their views known peacefully and publicly, just like in America we all rejoice in the right to be able to do. And President Trump was asked about, well, then, and then as, as, as the situation uh, escalated, uh, some white supremacists and others and, and, and uh, various... Uh, Violent groups uh, took to the streets violently. Now, that's not peaceful protest. That's not protected activity. That's violence. And the president condemned it and condemned them and condemned white supremacists and condemned uh, Antifa and condemned the people that were doing violence on both sides. Multiple times and publicly he condemned them. It's on the record. Look it up. And then he made a comment saying, well, you know, there are good people on both sides. And ever since then, Biden, Harris, the left, the fake news media, and the Democrats have been asserting publicly over and over and over and over again that the president said that there were good people among these violent white supremacists and others and that he did not condemn them. The president said that there were good people on both sides among the peaceful protesters. You take his whole statement. They like that they want to take just one sentence. He was talking about the peaceful protesters, 
And he actually condemned, in those very same remarks, the violence on both sides. And this, this notion that he somehow gave his permission, gave his blessing to violence, has been debunked multiple times over the last several years. And in the midst of that, Again, where a fifth grader could look up the correct information. You have a woman who is aspiring to the second highest office in the land who has the gall, who has the audacity to sit there in front of you and me and the rest of the American people and again bring this up. Is it gross ignorance or is it gross dishonesty? And which of those is appropriate for someone who wants to hold the second highest office in the land? Oh, and then she said the president only spent, uh, paid $750 in taxes. Again, does she not know how to read? This has been <laughs> publicly pointed out over and over again that the President of the United States has paid all the taxes that he owes. He did, not, he did not avoid paying, he did not fail to pay anything that he was legally obligated to pay. $750 one year in cash and all the rest in credit. Seven point four million dollars. The articles explaining this, I actually went through them the other night here on these programs. You can go back and see the video. And apparently we're going to have to talk about it again. Because you see a pattern developing here? There were 24 either outright lies, fabrications, or misleading statements made last night by this woman who wants to be the vice president. She won't be, but she wants to be. And you got to ask yourself, what kind of character does it show? What kind of character does it display? When you sit there and you make an assertion that has been publicly debunked time after time after time again, and explain, and can be explained very, very clearly, the president paid everything he owed. Now, the manner in which he pays it and the manner in which he, who has put so much into the economy, utilizes the complexities of the tax code in order to pay, in, 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 accumulate credit, tax credit, and then use that to pay off what he owes, which he did, and all the, it's there publicly for, for everyone to see. What are you doing when you make that assertion, that accusation? What are you doing? Senator Harris, when you sit there and you make this assertion as if to give the American people the impression that, oh, I can't support him. I mean, what, you know, he's, why is he not paying his fair share? I pay more than that myself. Is this, is, is this what you're trying to do? And, you know, if this is the way they are now, this is the way they will be if they're elected. Are they going to have some kind of conversion on election night? <laughs> Yeah. Okay, third thing I want to say today, just briefly, court packing. The Supreme Court, which has such a dominant role in our lives with the decisions it makes, is established by the Constitution. It's there in the Constitution. Okay? Article 3. Article 1 deals with Congress. Article 2 deals with the Presidency, executive branch, Article 3 deals with the courts. Article 3 of the Constitution says there shall be a Supreme Court. And then it says that Congress, Congress can establish other courts. So Congress establishes the other courts. What the Constitution in Article 3 does not say is how many justices will serve on the Supreme Court. The Constitution doesn't give us a number. Now, do you know how many justices there are on the Supreme Court? Okay, there are nine. There are nine justices. Right now, there are eight, 
because Ginsburg died, and now we have Amy Coney Barrett about to be confirmed, and she will be confirmed, by the way, and we'll talk more about that in the coming days. Now, the number nine, that's established by Congress and the President. It's like, like, like making a law, okay? They can adjust the number of judges on the Supreme Court. But they haven't, when the Supreme Court was first established, okay, there were six justices. Then for a while it went down to five, then it went back to six, then it went up to seven, then it went up to nine. For a short time it went up to ten, then it came back down to nine, and it's been like that at nine for 150 years. So for 150 years, we've had nine justices at any given time on the Supreme Court. That's the number of justices on the Supreme Court. Uh, it could be changed. Again, Congress and the President working together can change But they haven't seen the need to change it in a century and a half. Court packing refers very simply, people might hear that and, and they heard it last night in the debate if they watched the debate. They might not know what it means. It means something very simple. It means increase the number of justices. Now, if the experience of the court, if the experience of the American people and the judgment of our lawmakers were to come down to the conclusion that the American people and the court system and the country would be better served by having more justices on the Supreme Court, again, as I said, the Congress working together with the president could make that determination, as they have in the past. Like I tell you, the numbers, this was like in the, you know, in the, uh, in, the uh, in the 19th century, the numbers fluctuated a little bit. Okay, but for any other reason, shouldn't be done for political games. And the idea of court packing that is now being uh, talked about among the Democrats is this idea that, well, let's increase the number of justices because here's their, here's, their, here's their scenario. Let's say they get the White House and let's say they get the House and the Senate. So now they control the Congress, the lawmaking body, as well as the White House. The president signs the, the bills that Congress passes. So they could all work together, all this little Democrat enclave can work together, pass a bill, that the president signs, it says, okay, now we are going to have, instead of nine justices, we're going to have, oh, let's say 15. So we have nine already. Now, see, here's what's driving all this. Of the nine that we have now, again, looking at the confirmation of, 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 uh, of Judge Amy Barrett, it's going to be a six to three conservative majority. They're stuck with that for a while. Right. The oldest member of the court is also on the left wing of the court, uh, Justice Breyer. So if he were to step down, then we got a 7-2 to two conservative majority. And they don't like that. Democrats don't like that because they're radical left. So in the face of a situation, they're not going to be able to stop this, this confirmation of, of Amy Barrett. So they're like, oh, we have not, there's nothing we can do. Oh, wait a minute. We got an idea what we can do. If we win this election, we get the White House, the House, and the Senate. Well, then we have the authority to expand the number of, 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 uh, of, uh, of justices. So now, right now, there's a six to three. But if we add, if we add six more seats, we're the ones adding them. So we get to nominate, if we got the presidency and the Senate, we can confirm the liberal left-wing wacko justices that we want That'll look, you know, support abortion and all kinds of other crazy things. And we'll end up there, they're fantasizing. We'll end up then with a 12 to 3 majority. No, I'm sorry, what am I saying? We'll end up adding six justices. So now we'll add them in our camp and it'll be, we'll have the majority 6 to 9. This is, a, this is the fantasy. Now, it, it, it's, it's, it's fantasy thrown in with a little bit of truth because there would be the, the, the constitutional authority to do this. But you know what? President Franklin D. Roosevelt tried this. 
he tried this idea of court packing, and it didn't go very far. It was not popular. In fact, most of the American people don't, as I'm sure most of you, don't think it's a good idea. It was 1937. A court decision had been handed down that Roosevelt didn't like very much. He hadn't had the opportunity to appoint uh, a justice to the court. And so he got the bright idea of the idea of packing the court. Let's, let's increase. What his idea was, for every justice on the court who's over 70, if, if wherever justice was over 70, let's add one. Add an additional justice. So he would have added, like the example I just gave, he, was, he would have added up to six new justices. It didn't go anywhere. It didn't get the support. It didn't get the traction. Because, look, you start doing this, and then the, political, then the Supreme Court is more of a political uh, football than it already is. And, you know, when people understand the role of the court, they appreciate that it should be a neutral entity. It should be a, an objective entity. And that might seem like, at this point, a pipe dream, but the fact of the matter is that we have a constitution, and the judges and the justices are supposed to be applying that constitution, as we were saying before, not rewriting it. So this is the whole um, controversy about court pack. Court packing, just think of it as it's court, it's expanding. Putting the people you want to get a more solid and long-lasting majority. That's the simple uh, concept that we're dealing with here. Now, final point, and this brings us back to Biden and Harris. Final point. Would you do it? No response. Neither from Biden nor from Harris. Does that concern you? Because if they were thinking, eh, it didn't work that, that well with FDR and, well, you know, it's, it just makes the court more political and the American people don't like it too much, well, then why wouldn't they just say no? No, we're not, we're not, we're not, we're not, we're not going to do that. They could even say, I mean, a more acceptable answer than no answer would be, well, we're not inclined to do that right now, but we, you know, we reserve the right to think about it later. But we have no immediate plans to do it right now. You look, it's pretty clear to a lot of people they do have immediate plans to do it right now. If they were to win that much in the election. Would you do it? So our question is, don't the American people deserve a response to that? Because this greatly affects our lives, the lives of our children and grandchildren, if they were to add more justices to the court. You see, this is their way out of this, this nightmare scenario now of, of, of Amy Coney Barrett being confirmed, and now you've got all these pro-life justices up there. They're going to make the final decision in very consequential cases that bind the rest of the courts. And it's like... Uh, Oh, this is a nightmare scenario for them. Oh, how do we get ourselves out of it? Court packing. Yeah, but shouldn't we know that that's what we're electing? That's what we're choosing if we elect you. That's what we're choosing. If we elect Democrat senators, they might want to change the structure of the Supreme Court. They might want to put their people in there. It's all politically motivated. Okay. Keep pressing the question, just like the question of his which, okay, so let's connect that question with another question that Biden has failed to answer and Harris has failed to answer, which is, okay, what if you were to do that? Or even if you were not to do that, but when there is a vacancy on the court, as there will eventually be, who would you appoint? President Trump has been completely transparent and faithful to his promises. He made a list. He said, any vacancies on the court I have to fill, I will choose from this list. So you know who they are. You can do your research on them. Amy Coney Barrett's name has been out there for years. You can do your research on them. You can find out what they, what, how they think and how they decide on cases, what their philosophy is. And if you don't like them, then don't vote for me. Shouldn't we be entitled to the same kind of information and to the same kind of decision making from Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. You see, when the president said, and I referred to this earlier, we are returning power to the American people, 
This is another example of what he means. More power to you. More informed consent. You know what you're getting. Here's the people I would appoint to the Supreme Court. He's still committing himself to that list. So in a second term, more vacancies, he's going to go to that list. We can start researching these people now. And we'll know exactly what we're getting. We can research these people before we vote. And we'll know what we're getting on the Supreme Court. And this is returning power to the people because we don't get the, we don't get the opportunity to vote for a name on the ballot for Supreme Court. This is the closest we can get to it. President Trump has brought us the closest that we can get to that. More power over the destiny of our nation, for our families, for our children, for our churches, for our security, for our economy, for our laws, for our constitution. He's given more power to us than we've ever had before in this regard. Now don't we think about the court and it's just, oh, we have no power over the court. Oh, it's this big entity out there and I have no control over it. But it controls my life in many ways. <sighs> Don't we have the right? Isn't it more power for us to know Biden, liar that you are, you scared coward? Tell us! You know why he's a coward to tell us? Because there would be some of the most left-wing radical nuts on that list that it would turn off the American people. It would turn them off. I don't, I, are you crazy? I put that person on the Supreme Court. Let's go, Biden. Open up. Stop hiding in the basement. Stop keeping all these secrets. Open up. If you expect anybody to vote for you. Vice President Pence was very clear last night. He asked Kamala Harris straight out. Well, she wouldn't answer the question. Why not? She wouldn't answer the question. Okay, friends, we've gone long enough tonight. Thank you for uh, following with me all of these ideas and these thoughts. And uh, let's reach the voters every day. Find more ways to reach more voters with information like this. Encourage them to get out there and vote the right way. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with kindness and give you his peace. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father Frank Pavone here of Priests for Life. Thanks for watching, and we'll talk to you tomorrow.